Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. The world braces for Monday morning chaos. Why the work week could escalate a cyber attack. A debate explodes over cultural voices and what kind of writers get heard in Canada. We talk to the editor who set off a firestorm. To call me, you know, a racist is to really degrade the conversation we should be having. North Korea's missile hits a new height in a way that Russia can't ignore. Plus, does Donald Trump fit the profile of a tyrant, or do critics need to back down? The ransom message is almost apologetic. Oops, it says, your files have been encrypted. But with those words, tens of thousands of hospitals, schools and businesses across the globe have been plunged into a days-long data nightmare. And now cybersecurity officials warn that in a matter of hours, it could get worse. Thomas Degg has the latest on the largest cyber attack of its kind and what's coming next. British hospitals turning patients away. Trouble for trains in Germany and French car maker Renault stopping production. Just some of the disruptions caused by the global cyber attack. The European police agency said today there are 2,000 victims in more than 150 countries. This bug will be sitting in systems over the weekend that are so far not being used. And when people arrive to work on Monday morning and, and turn on their computer, I think we'll see the numbers going up again. Until then, at least, British authorities say the spread has slowed, thanks to an anonymous blogger known only as Malware Tech, who stumbled upon a virtual kill switch hidden in the code of the malicious software. We have stopped this one, but there will be another one coming and it will not be stoppable by us. Cybersecurity experts say hackers have already developed a new, tougher version of the so-called WannaCry virus. People do need to be updating their software as quickly as possible because this kill switch is, is pretty much dead already. The malicious code targets a vulnerability in Windows. Microsoft offered a fix in March, but those who didn't install it remained vulnerable. Cyber specialist Paulo Shakarian heard chatter about the attack two weeks ago. That the hackers had identified tens of thousands of machines with that vulnerability. And again, they specifically cited uh, medical institutions as a, a prime target. Now, more than 48 hours after the attack began, Britain's National Health Service is still warning patients to expect delays and scrambling to contain the damage. We're working with big brain, biggest brains in the industry. We run a large system. We take our responsibilities really seriously. A hospital in Oshawa, Ontario is also taking this very seriously. Lake Ridge Health confirms its computers were hit by the ransomware on Friday, one of the few known Canadian victims. Tonight, the president of Microsoft, the company whose operating system was targeted, has spoken about this for the first time. He says governments should see this attack as a wake-up call and now treat cyber weapons just as seriously as they do traditional weapons. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, London. Canada has so far gotten off relatively lightly in this attack, but Canadian institutions have been hit by previous ransomware attacks, a sign the country is vulnerable. In November last year, Carleton University warned students its network was compromised by a virus. A student reported the ransomware demanded tens of thousands of dollars in Bitcoin to unlock affected computers. The university said no ransom was paid. But months earlier, in June, the University of Calgary did pay about $20,000 to release computers captured by ransomware. To Washington now, where the calls are growing louder for Congress to launch an impeachment investigation into Donald Trump. The U.S. president is being accused of obstructing justice when he fired the director of the FBI last week. But that's not all. Today, a former director of national intelligence accused Trump of something far more insidious. Paul Hunter has the details. Now the inadvertent focus of a political firestorm, James Comey, the former director of the FBI, said nothing as he got into an SUV this morning in Virginia and headed off to a church service. But his abrupt firing last week by Donald Trump is the talk of a still-stunned U.S. Capitol. The developments 
of the past week very bothersome, very disturbing to me. James Clapper, director of U.S. intelligence under Barack Obama, today had this blunt assessment of what happened to Comey and beyond. I think in many ways our institutions are under assault. External assault, he said, meaning alleged Russian interference in last year's election, and he added internal. Internally from the president? Exactly. Amid conflicting explanations for the firing last week, Trump put it this way. Because he wasn't doing a good job, very simply. He was not doing a good job. But the president was fiercely criticized because Comey had been leading the FBI's investigation into whether members of the Trump campaign colluded with Russia last year to interfere in the election. So at the end of a week that also saw Trump all smiles while meeting with Russian officials in the Oval Office, with no U.S. media allowed, a broad and damning suggestion. Comey's firing was aimed at stifling that investigation. As one lawmaker put it today, To fire him mid-investigation, boy, oh boy, that raises a whole lot of questions. Meanwhile, that Trump tweet Friday suggesting there might be secret recordings of his conversations with Comey brought more mockery on late-night TV. If he's crazy, he's crazy like a fox with mental problems. <laughs> Along with more comparisons with disgraced President Richard Nixon and demands that Trump show anything he's got. You can't be cute about tapes. If there are any tapes of this conversation, they need to be turned over. The whole thing's got some observers calling for impeachment as Democrats threaten to stall confirmation hearings for Comey's replacement unless a special prosecutor is named. To have that special prosecutor, people would breathe a sigh of relief because then there would be a real independent person overlooking the FBI director. On that, job interviews this weekend for some of the 14 candidates to replace Comey. Guiding the process, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who'd earlier recused himself from any Russia investigation because of his own links to Russian officials. Now he's helping to choose the person to lead it. Trump says this will be a speedy process. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A paranoid, reckless menace. That's how Washington and Seoul are describing North Korean leader Kim Jong-un today after his latest missile test. Even longtime ally China is upset. There's deep concern on both sides of the Pacific over just how much farther the missile flew this time. Sasha Petrusik has more. North Korea's previous missile launches this year have had mixed success. Several have exploded shortly after liftoff, but today's test raises eyebrows. The missile was launched before dawn from a base northwest of Pyongyang. It flew about 700 kilometers before landing in the Sea of Japan. But what was remarkable was its altitude, reaching a height of 2,000 kilometers, likely a record for the North Korean missile program. Not the intercontinental ballistic missile North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has threatened to hit the U.S. with, but getting closer, say experts. Possibly an entirely new threat that puts major U.S. bases, like the one in Guam, within range. Japan, too. Considering it flew 30 minutes, says Japan's defense minister, and with such an altitude, we believe this may be a new type of ballistic missile. The test comes just days after South Korea elected a new president, one who proposes negotiations with the North. Moon Jae-in's tone was noticeably tougher this morning, delivering this message through a spokesperson. While South Korea remains open to dialogue with North Korea, he says, it is only possible when there is a change in attitude, an end to provocations. The Trump administration's policy toward North Korea has been far from clear so far. Threats mixed with offers of dialogue. Well, I think you first have to get into um, Kim Jong-un's head. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. suggests everything is still on the table. What we're going to do is continue to tighten the screws. He feels it. He absolutely feels it. And we're going to continue, whether it's sanctions, whether it's press statements. In Beijing today, where a North Korean delegation was spotted at an economic summit hosted by China, there was condemnation of the test from both the Chinese and the Russian presidents. Vladimir Putin's been relatively quiet on North Korea's weapons program, 
But with today's missile landing less than 100 kilometers from Russian territory, he may get more involved. The U.S. is certainly pushing for that. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Beijing. It has been days of fury, rancor and regrets as a debate on cultural appropriation explodes. Ground Zero, an editorial in a little-known Canadian literary magazine that called for a, quote, appropriation prize for writers. For some in the established media, it was a little fun in the name of free expression. For others, including Indigenous writers, it was another blank check for cultural theft. Lorenda Radikoff has more. An article in this tiny publication with just 1,200 subscribers has stirred up a huge controversy. The column suggests Canadian literature is bland because white authors are afraid of cultural appropriation. It's tongue-in-cheek, suggesting a so-called appropriation prize for authors who write about other cultures. Hal Nidvietsky wrote the piece and this week resigned as the magazine's editor. I'm stunned. I'm stunned by the reaction uh, and what has come out of it. That reaction included a flurry of apparently joking tweets by some senior journalists, including one from the CBC, offering money for that fictitious appropriation prize. Some have apologized, but a fierce debate followed. Jonathan Kay of Walrus Magazine spoke out against what he called the mobbing of the original article's author. It's often the very first And yesterday topic. debated the topic on air. Today, he stepped down, though he says it was for unrelated reasons. Nidvietsky says he understands the controversy. I certainly see why, why people took offense. Um, I see that uh, the context in which I presented my arguments was culturally insensitive. Nidvietsky also I, has a message I, for the Indigenous that. writers uh, featured in that issue of the magazine. I'm sorry that their good work is being overshadowed by this, uh, you know, this, this, this sort of controversy uh, around a few misplaced words. My initial reaction was, you know, being angry and, and also being hurt. The publisher of this online magazine says it all underlines ignorance of the struggle for Indigenous people to represent themselves. We need to educate ourselves deeply about these issues and we need to, I think, as a society, share in power and have, you know, Indigenous people take on positions of leadership. This is just the latest controversy involving cultural appropriation. The publisher of Muskrat magazine says those plus revelations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission show what's really needed isn't more cultural appropriation, but sensitivity. Lorenda Radakomp, CBC News, Toronto. Jonathan Kay is a frequent contributor to this show and one of the figures at the forefront of today's story. I spoke with him earlier. So, John, why, why did you quit? Well, I should say that it didn't really have much to do with the cultural appropriation issue. Uh, this was a long time coming. People don't get along with their boss sometimes. It happens. Uh, I'm not the first person to quit on that basis. Okay, well, the timing's something, but <laughs> that aside, um, do you think that you did something wrong in what you said or what you wrote? Well, I think my initial tweet where I called out the Writers Union of Canada for their extremely harsh treatment of the editor, outgoing editor of Write Magazine, which is their in-house publication. I certainly have no uh, regret about that tweet. I think it was actually appalling how that guy was treated. Uh, however, what happened was that tweet then became the basis for lots of people piling on, and then it became something of a joke and a very serious issue, which is... About the appropriation prize yeah. and people kicking in money. That, you weren't supportive of that. I didn't offer money for the prize, but people did treat it very flippantly, and I certainly should have called it out at the time, because it's a serious issue. Uh, it's certainly something that Indigenous people take extremely seriously, and for a bunch of white people in Toronto to be treating it like a joke must have looked not only insensitive, but cruel. So now we have a number of these people who were part of the joke, um, who joined in on the joke, uh, saying that they're sorry, that they're listening. Are, has something positive happened here? Where are we? Well, I think something positive has happened in the sense that you have people across Canada now understand some of the, the pain that is experienced by Indigenous people who feel that their stories are, are being stolen. I've heard from many of those people on Twitter and otherwise. Unfortunately, I think the result might be that you're getting a restriction on artistic freedom because the reaction is going to be that 
Maybe if you're black, you're not going to feel comfortable writing First Nations stories or First Nations characters, or if you're First Nations, you're not going to feel comfortable writing black stories, or if you're black, you're not going to feel comfortable writing a protagonist from the Irish potato famine, or, or if you're Gentile, you're not going to feel comfortable writing about the Holocaust. And I, I, I think that's awful. I think artists should be encouraged to write about all cultures. We emphasize the concept of, of empathy and projection in, in every other aspect of our society. And yet but to artists... push back a little bit, the Indigenous writers are saying that there, there was no empathy shown with, with the jokes made about an issue that they thought was so important. I think in the case of Indigenous writing and stories, you actually have a special case. Uh, you ha yesterday, uh, Jesse Wente of the CBC, uh, I was with him on air, and he made the point that many Indigenous societies they literally had their land and their possessions and in some cases their language stolen from them. So it would make sense that they, they would be extremely sensitive about somebody coming in and also taking their narratives. Uh, but you feel that people generally are more divided after this debate? I think this debate has resulted in people hardening their opinions on both sides. And I think there's going to be a chill factor because if you're, let's say your background is First Nations and you're trying to sell a novel with a black protagonist, to a major publishing house, they're going to be less likely to publish that because they feel they're going to be called out as racist on social media because you didn't have the person staying in their racial lane. And again, as a writer, I object to that. I think that people should, with due respect to the culture being written about, uh, have the artistic freedom to write about any culture. John, thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up on our Sunday Talk, he gives government jobs to family and fired a political threat. Is Donald Trump mounting a coup or just making a mess? Plus, a political historian makes the case for impeachment. It's not just the firing of Comey, of course. It's the lies that were issued by the White House. Alan Lichtman has a long record of being right. The World Health Organization confirmed a second case of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Another 17 suspected cases are being investigated after an outbreak was declared a few days ago. Health officials are now trying to track about 125 people believed to be linked to the cases. The last big Ebola outbreak in the DRC killed 49 people in 2014. Meanwhile, an outbreak of cholera in Yemen has killed at least 115 people. More than 8,000 others are sick. But with the country's civil war raging, hospital beds are scarce. Health officials warn without international aid, a full-blown epidemic could sweep the country. In France, the new president was sworn in today. Thirty-nine-year-old Emmanuel Macron was received by outgoing President François Hollande at Elysee Palace. The two held a closed-door meeting where Macron received the codes to France's nuclear arsenal. Afterwards, a large crowd of well-wishers greeted the new president and first lady outside. CBC News has learned the release of Canada's new defence policy is being delayed. The long overdue plan won't be released until after a summit of NATO leaders later this month, despite pressure from the US and other NATO countries to boost military spending. David Cochran explains. The original plan was for the defence policy review to be made public at some point this week so Justin Trudeau could go to NATO with a detailed plan for Canada's military. But this delay means that the Prime Minister will head to a gathering of alliance leaders in what will also be US President Donald Trump's first summit with no public commitment to boost Canada's military capabilities. Now to avoid some controversy, sources tell CBC News that the Americans were given a sneak peek at the new policy and were pleased with its contents. Senior Canadian officials say the release of the defense review has been delayed so that the government can include it in a broader rollout of foreign policy goals. Now, the defense plan has already been a year in the making. It will set the future direction of Canada's military in terms of expectations, spending, and equipment. And many critical decisions, including the replacement of aircraft, ships, and vehicles, have been in a holding pattern because of this review. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Straight ahead, has Donald Trump set himself up for impeachment? Historian Alan Lichtman says this is worse than Watergate. Hi, I'm Wendy Mesley with The National. We've started doing something a little bit special for the last little while on Facebook. Um, taking questions during the commercial break. So yeah, we want you to stick around. 
but we're also interested in hearing what you want to know. And this, this is where it all happens. Oh, it says he national. It's actually the <laughs> national. Um, and the doors, yes, they're very tall. Peter's tall. He's kind of a giant, actually. Yeah, so this is it. This is where we pick up a microphone and the little, see, I've got a little thing in my ear and I've got, I've got, a, I've got a microphone and a pack on the back, which are, they're very easy for men to hide in their suits, not so much for women, but come on in. So this is, hi everybody. This is the National Studio. So these are, we have the lighting board and the sound board and over here we have the cameras. This is where Peter does his, uh, does at issue and where we do Sunday talk on Sunday nights. And there's moving pictures that are fed in when we're doing, uh, when we're doing the news. And these are the cameras and you can see, okay, it, it is a, a little bit like Anchorman too. Yes, there, there are scripts that are put up into the camera. Um, yeah, so we, it's all, the show is sort of planned. We know what's coming. We've seen the scripts ahead of time, we being the anchors. Then we read them. That's if things go according to plan, but they don't always go according to plan. So just recently, Donald Trump, he sent a bunch of missiles over to Syria, and it happened just as, the, as our newscast was going to air. I was here also when uh, President Obama uh, launched the strike that took out Osama bin Laden, and at that point, there is no script, there's no plan, all there is, we have one computer, so we're up on computer, we're following what's happening on the wires, I have my phone, and I'm checking on Twitter to see what has happened there, and you just fly by the seat of your pants, and they'll say, okay, well, Samantha Nutt or Brian Stewart, they're in studio, or Neil McDonald's on the phone from Washington, and yeah, and so I have people yelling in my ears, and I see pictures coming up, so anyway, you can ask me anything about that. Uh, we're going to go uh, to commercial break, uh, soon. You've got to send in your questions between this commercial break and when we go live, which is very, very soon. And we will try and answer your questions and I'll answer almost anything. So that will be in the comments section. So anything other than where'd you buy that dress? There's no fashion advice here. So that's it. We really do want to hear from you and we will answer you live in the next break. He's a showboat. He's a grandstander. I was going to fire Comey. My decision. It was not. You had made the decision before they came. Uh, in the I, room. I was going to fire Comey. Will that decision come back to haunt U.S. President Donald Trump? American historian Alan Lichtman thinks so. He calls it worse than Watergate. And Lichtman does have a long history of being proven right. He's accurately called every U.S. election win since 1984, including Trump's last fall. Now he's predicting Trump will be impeached. Lichtman's book, The Case for Impeachment, examines how he thinks that could play out. I spoke with Alan Lichtman earlier. So, Alan, after you correctly predicted that Donald Trump would become president, he sent you a, a tweet saying, gee, thanks, congrats, I, he's probably not so happy with you now. I'm waiting for his letter, or at least his tweet. And Mr. Trump, I have to tell you, there is a chapter in my book, The Case for Impeachment, called The Way Out. Because you were so gracious to me, I've given you some friendly advice on how you can avoid impeachment. However, I don't think you've paid much attention to it yet. Well, we won't go there just yet. You, you've predicted he will be impeached, and you've suggested now there really is a case for this with the firing of, uh, of Comey. What, what, what's the basis for that? Yeah, it's not just the firing of Comey, of course. It's the lies that were issued by the White House in support of the firing of Comey. It's the fact that the firing of Comey came right after the devastating testimony of a act, of acting attorney general Sally Yates that the national security advisor to Donald Trump was a danger to national security because he was compromised by the Russians. It came right after subpoenas were issued to Michael Flynn and his associates, and it came right after apparently Mr. Comey had 
thought this investigation was significant enough to ask for additional resources. And Donald Trump himself admitted that he was thinking about the Russia investigation when he fired Mr. Comey. That's at least borderline obstruction of justice. And add to that the fact that the White House pretty transparently conspired earlier with Representative Nunes to, to derail the House investigation into possible Russian collusion. Putting it all together, and you've got a probable cause case for obstruction of justice, and there's only one way of dealing with that constitutionally. The framers, as I point out in the case for impeachment, put impeachment into the Constitution as a legal, peaceful, and orderly means of saving our democracy from a rogue president. So and you say that there's a, a lot of issues here, a lot of possibilities for building a case. But just back to Comey, you're saying now that this is a worse case than Watergate and reminding us that it, it wasn't actually the tapes in Watergate that led to Nixon stepping down, that it was the firing of the special investigator Archibald Cox. That's right. It was the Saturday Night Massacre in October of 1973, the firing of Archibald Cox that, first of all, turned public opinion against Richard Nixon. For the first time, a plurality of Americans favored his impeachment. And secondly, it was the firing that triggered the impeachment investigation that ultimately in the House Judiciary Committee would lead to the voting of three articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon, with more than one third of Republicans joining in in voting for at least one of those articles. And then, of course, to avoid what would have been certain impeachment in the House, but Nixon do, resigned. But do you see that happening? Do you see Republicans are in control of the House? Do you, do you see that happening, of them calling for the kind of investigation that could lead to impeachment? Well, I would start by calling upon every Republican in the House to do what so many Republicans did during Watergate. But do you Put see that happening? Patriotism over party. Yes, here's why I see it happening. First of all, if the Democrats stand firm, it would only take some two dozen Republicans to shift. That's just 10 percent of Republicans in the House. And a Lickman rule of politics is that for office holders, their prime requirement is survival. And if they see Trump as a liability, at least two dozen could turn against him. You mentioned that one of the cases for possible impeachment is lying, remembering, I suppose, that Bill Clinton, that's what he was impeached for, was not his activities, but for lying about it. He was impeached both for obstruction of justice and for lying under oath in a deposition that started in a deposition in a civil suit. And Trump faces lots of civil suits. He has a history of inveterate lying, and he could well be caught in the Clinton impeachment trap. In the case for impeachment, I lay out eight possible grounds, and one of them is lying. So there are calls right now for a special prosecutor instead of uh, Donald Trump appointing a replacement for Comey. Uh, people are saying there should be a special prosecutor. Uh, what do you think of that? I think that is most misguided. I think that's the best way to save Donald Trump for the following reasons. But that's what the Democrats reasons. are asking for. And, and the Democrats need to read my book and listen to this broadcast. Uh, they're they're off on the that? wrong track. Let me tell you. Number one. Trump appoints the special prosecutor. Number two, Trump can fire the special prosecutor, just as Richard Nixon fired Archibald Cox. Number three, special prosecutors take years to do their work. The special prosecutor in the Iran-Contra case took over six years to issue his final report. The constitutional remedy here is not a special prosecutor. It is an impeachment investigation in the House Judiciary Committee that should be fully staffed, like the Watergate Committee, which had 44 lawyers and some 100 staff members. It would be conducted by another branch of government. It would be entirely independent of Donald Trump, and it would have the clout to keep Donald Trump from obstructing it. So I'm going to ask you for another prediction. If he actually is impeached, which would obviously be a long process if ever it began, uh, wouldn't Mike Pence become president? Is, are you predicting that? Mike Pence would become president, and I am predicting that with one caveat. You know, the media has given Mike Pence a huge pass. You know, he lied about General Flynn. He lied about the reasons why 
uh, Mr. Comey was fired. Well, he says he was media, misled about Flynn. I, I'm about to get to that. <laughs> and the media says he was misled. We don't know that he was misled. That's a supposition on the part of the media. In fact, maybe he was part of this whole operation right from the start, and maybe he's in it as deeply as Donald Trump. We do not know, and an impeachment investigation needs to look at uh, Mr. Pence as well. A vice president is no less subject constitutionally to impeachment than a president. Well, these are uh, some big predictions. People are talking a lot more about it. We'll <laughs> see whether the Republicans are listening to you. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Lichtman. Thank you. So that's how you might deal with a president gone rogue. But has Trump really earned the label of tyrant? That's next on our Sunday Talk. Hi there. So we're about to take your questions on Facebook. I hope you enjoyed that interview. We have a panel coming up discussing whether or not uh, Donald Trump is a tyrant or whether... People should just chill, so I hope you'll stick around for that. But now I'm going to take your questions. So I have to put my glasses on for this because the print is very small and I'm getting very old. So the first question, um, I don't really have a book to recommend. Uh, what person, alive or deceased, do you want to interview the most? That question is from Wendy Whalen. Um, this may surprise you, but it's not a world leader or some terrible bad person or big movie star. Um, it's Dolly Parton, <laughs> of all people. I have this thing about Dolly Parton and actually Lucille Ball, who were sort of very early feminists, uh, who were seen either as goofballs or as people who weren't great singers, but perhaps a great songwriter. So I had an opportunity where I thought I was going to be able to interview Dolly. We had it all set up. But then she said, you have to come to Memphis, and I was, or some town just outside. And I was like, well, that's OK. And then, of course, she said it was when it was going to be my family holiday, and so we couldn't go. So that was very, very sad. So there, that's my big scoot, Dolly Parton. Um, Peter Greco asks, how do you prioritize which story airs? That is really, really hard. Tonight, actually, we had a debate about what to do with our... Uh, whether Trump and the Comey story was a big enough one to lead with still again, or whether that story was getting tired, whether the debate over cultural appropriation was the big thing that we should focus on because that's sort of, it's, it's a huge issue among writers and journalists and on Twitter, but does it really affect absolutely everybody? Or should we lead with the story that tomorrow... A lot of people, in theory, could get hit with some, some kind of ransomware about their computers, and we thought that had the most relevance. So we have debates. Sometimes they're very hard fought uh, every day, uh, and that was the one tonight. Uh, if I mess up during a broadcast, can it be edited before it goes live, or do you just have to run over your, your mistake? Well, um, first of all, I have never, ever messed up. Um, ever in all my years? No. Uh, so what happens is we do fix it. We do. We go live at uh, at ten o'clock to the Maritimes, and uh, and then we fix stuff for ten o'clock, and we keep breaking news, and we keep updating through until two o'clock in the morning if there's breaking news, particularly if it's on the west coast, and um, uh, yeah. So we. We are always fixing things. So it's a little bit difficult, but we do that. One last quick question. What is your view on the future of journalism in this era of fake news? I've only got about 15, 20 seconds left. But it's basically just to keep doing our job and hope people will believe in us and to try and present both sides of the argument and perhaps to present different arguments than people have heard in the past, but just to keep trying to do our job as, as best we can. And we are out of time. Thanks. Time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. When Donald Trump fired the man in charge of investigating him, dire accusations quickly followed. On CNN, presidential historian Douglas Brinkley said, quote, Donald Trump just behaved like a tyrant. We've heard whispers of this before, when Trump installed family members in influential positions or demonized the press. Now, the sacking of FBI Director James Comey has ramped up the tyranny talk. Is Donald Trump pulling off a bloodless coup, or are his critics prepared to believe anything? 
I'm joined by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a talk radio host in Toronto and a columnist with iPolitics. Stephen Marsh is an author and a columnist with Esquire magazine. And Lincoln Blades joins us tonight. He's a journalist who writes about U.S. politics for Teen Vogue and Rolling Stone. So welcome, Lincoln. I'll come to you in just a moment. But uh, Stephen, I'm going to start with you. Is Trump... A tyrant, or should people chill out a bit? I think he's basically the dictionary definition of tyrant. Tyrant is a very old word, but it's actually very appropriate because, to me, the most, the most important feature of democracy as it's developed from Greece on has been equality under the law, which means that no one is above the law. No one is above the application of the law. And when you have the person in power firing the people who are tr trying to apply the law to him, that is the that's the dictionary definition of ty tyranny. What do you think? Tyrant? Um, I don't think that he's a tyrant, and I don't think that we should chill out. Um, when I say I don't think he's a tyrant, I don't believe that, like when I think of the word tyrant, I think of absolute power. And I don't think that he necessarily defines someone who is after um, absolute power in the sense of he wants to control and centralize it within himself. He's the type of man that has a lot, that outsources a lot of his worldview to Steve Bannon, right. also as well to um, Pence, who he wants to do a lot of the governing. Uh, that's why I don't see him as a tyrant, but we do not, we should not under any means chill out. Tasha? Um, I think he is a tyrannical CEO, and I use that word simply because um, he comes from a very obviously a business background. And I think that Trump's approach to governing is exactly to ignore the whole issue of the rule of law, ignore the concept of democracy. He doesn't have any grounding in that. He so behaves, he's an oligarch? Yes, he is like an, <laughs> he would be like an oligarch. He behaves in a way that he, use, he used to become famous. The, the phrase, you're fired, made him famous, made him famous in television, and also that's how he ran his company. If you were on his side, you were on his side. If you weren't loyal to him, you were out. So he's unfortunately brought those things to bear, but I don't think he has necessarily a grand design for the government or a policy background that he's trying to bring to bear as a tyrant. Not that that's good, but it, it's a distinction, I would say. So make. not a strategic genius then, yeah. uh, Lincoln? So I, I have a question for you. Yes. Do you think that he wants to be president of the United States? You know, I've actually heard that he didn't. I've actually heard from people who knew him in the campaign, who'd known him before the campaign, who said he came in there to make a point, to get publicity for his businesses, to be someone who shook things up, but didn't actually think it would go the distance. So but what the, difference does that make? I don't know if that's true, but that, I heard that. Because to me, if you're, if you're a tyrant and you want absolute power, then shouldn't you want to be in the position that gives you absolute power? But I don't think his Hold motives... On. An, interview, an yeah. interview recently came out where he said, I didn't think this president of the United States job would be harder yes. than the last job I had, which was being a reality TV star. Right. He was lamenting the fact that he was president of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's not a feature of a tyrant. That's a feature of someone who's in over his head. Look, trying to figure out Trump's motives is just not possible. I mean, it's like trying to get the bottom eel out of a, out of a barrel of eels. Like <laughs> Why it's, do you say that? Though? Well, because he's just, it's, it's unfathomable. It's like it's someone with narcissistic personality disorder, someone with a borderline personality disorder. Well, you can't, we don't know but, that. But, you're well, right. Well, I'm sorry. Though, but you, but don't, you don't know. You okay, don't, but, with, but it doesn't matter. Those His motives aside, don't matter because the thing is not. Do you not, not think he's transparent? No, I definitely think he's not transparent. I think he contains great depth. What? But I think I think the pr the point are you, is are you, here. Are you being? I'm oh, being serious sorry, for sure. You, okay. I think the, the absolute thing here is that it's not, it's not, his motives don't matter. It's the fact that what he's done to the, the system of government is that Sally Yates went after him, so he fired her. Preet Bharara went mm -hmm. after him, so he fired Which him. Which is exactly so, what you so, would do if you were in a company and you didn't like people who were under you who were, who were saying things you didn't like to listen to. This is Trump also. He surrounds himself with yes men or family, people who will listen to him and who will also agree with him all the time. And that is, and again, it's a failing of leadership, but it's so also something said that he's not you see a necessarily, but no. you're concerned. What are you concerned about? Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about the fact that I just don't think that he's intellectually or motivated, or motivated to do this job. Because you're the leader of the free world, and it's a position that when you come into, you're coming into it with the knowledge of, I want to be in here for eight years. And when I look at him, the, if I had to make a comparison to who Trump is, uh, and I was going to use Game of Thrones for an example. So let's just say the real world was Westeros. He's not a Stark. He's not a Targaryen. And if he was the Lannisters, he would be Joffrey Lannister. <laughs> he is not interested. He's interested in vengefulness. He's interested in sort of getting the people who attack him. That's why he goes on his Twitter. People 
can look on his Twitter and you can look at Fox News and you can actually align who he's going to attack based on who he is seeing at a specific time in the morning. Mm -hmm. That to me doesn't ring true of a tyrant. That rings true of someone who's just and, vengeful and, he also and listen, The last person to give him advice is often the person who will determine his policy or yeah. the last thing he sees. And we saw that, for example, um, in terms of Syria. And he decided based on a photograph and an emotional response to go forward with bombing when he had said he would not do that. So, Tasha, in the past, you've argued that there are lots of checks and balances in the American mm -hmm. system that, that, you know, whatever he might want to accomplish, he can't necessarily... Do you still believe that? Um, I believe there are. I think, obviously, what he's done with Comey is it... It is is the it's wrong. It is it is compromising that system. Um, but at the same time, there are other checks and balances. There is Congress. There is also the fact that he does not command any kind of military force, and that is a distinction I would make also in terms of tyranny. Um, traditionally, dictators who have had coups, uh, bloody coups usually, have commanded military force to do it. He does not have brown shirts. He does not have people, military organized military, to back up anything. In that sense, it is it is an important the, distinction to he's make. He's the Stephen. commander in chief. He do you think the, the army Marine. would follow? Donald on the, Trump. He is, on, he is the commander in chief of the greatest military force the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. and the, and the and fact do you think that he they would willing, all line up behind him to do his bidding on X, Y, Z? Do you think would, they would? He is, absolute, he is the commander in chief. He is absolutely able. If he wants to nuke anyone this afternoon, he will. He can. He, no one can stop him. I think, I think that the enemy, the enemy of justice is goodwill to your job is keeping your job. So I don't think it's necessarily about him commanding a force who's gonna be so evil and against him. I think what it is is about commanding people as the president of the United States. And he'll be able to say, you know what, I am the president of the United States. And everyone will say, okay, well, he's the commander in chief. And mm -hmm. when, his, when his orders roll down, they keep rolling down to people who are gonna actually go out there and follow their job. I think that's what the scary he thing is. He fires anyone who shows the slightest resistance to him. The Republican Party who is in power has shown exactly zero spine. I see no, I see absolutely no evidence that the, the so-called checks and balances are in place. There's an impeachment process. There's well, an impeachment Alan process Heisman, that could be followed through. The, uh, the historian who correctly predicted yes. every uh, presidential win since uh, 1984 is now predicting he will be impeached. Exactly. And says the Comey situation, the firing, is enough to get him impeached. But that would require Republicans to get on side. He's saying perhaps that, but do you see that happening? Do you I, see Republicans turning on Trump? I what would it take? So in, for U.S. politicians, and I interview a lot of Congress people, and their biggest fear is being primaried. They don't want to lose mm -hmm. their jobs. So it's not about the, the political apparatus is dependent on their state. It's dependent on their, con yeah. uh, on their district. So if, at the end of the day, if the political mood amongst the people does not change, then the politicians themselves aren't going to change. How many politicians have we seen step out fervently against Trump and then ended up having to support him? People like Ted Cruz. Everyone but uh, John McCain. John McCain. <laughs> Nikki say. Haley came out strong against Donald Trump. Yeah. And look at the job that she has now, right? Mm -hmm. right? So it's like this idea that you're gonna come out against Trump, it is to come out against some so of the most fervent parts of your base. Then? No, I don't. And I think we're at the point where we have to ask if the Republican Party ever really was any different than this. Like, I mean, now, now this is the party of McCarthy and Nixon and Trump, right? And these are people who have very little respect for democratic norms or the rule of law when it, when it is in conflict with their own power. And I take your point that these people have jobs and they're trying to keep their jobs. But, I mean, surely at some point, the, the, the freedom of your country has to stand, it has to, has to come America. before... I your job. There's, there's no historical precedent of that. You know what? You're right. There isn't. And it's appalling. And that's why what we're seeing here is like actually probably the most important political event. But I, I, don't, I don't think, I think as important as this event is, mm. I don't think this is going to end up being as politically detrimental as people think it would. Alan Lichtman was other, saying that this is worse than Watergate. It's worse than the firing I, of the special I, prosecutor. I, I agree with that. And I think these times are different. We live in a time of bipartisan patriotism. And yeah, that's, that's right. the problem. Tasha, you were trying to get in here? I was going to simply say, I don't think the Republican Party made Trump. In fact, the Republican Party feared the election of Trump. The Republican Party wanted to do everything it could to prevent it. The people that got Trump in 
were an electorate that felt disenfranchised, dissatisfied, and unrepresented by any political party. And if you saw at the convention, you didn't see uh, the words liberty and those kinds of things appearing in Trump's speeches. You saw the party. So if party it's the people, and not the Trump. party, then yes. when does when do the well, people ever is, change their mind? This they is don't. the issue of of the tyrant. If the tyrant can appeal to that, and I agree, this is the danger. This is one of the dangers of tyranny. Is that, and this is you've seen this throughout history, appealing to that disenfranchised people and leading that people. And if he can keep connecting with them, he can maintain what he's doing. Well, but last quick word but, to Stephen, and then uh, like, that may not happen. Supposedly, the American Constitution is the greatest instrument ever devised for moderating tyrannical mob rule mm -hmm. with institutions. It's the beacon on the hill. And so Trump has just taken an axe and gutted that. I mean, he has just. He has just said, I if you're, he's if you're, if you're, a if you're, if you're, if you're a policeman, if you're a policeman and you come after, well, if you're a policeman and you come after the president, you can just be fired. This is, this is a violation of a democratic norm that has gone back in Anglo-American tradition to 1215. That's I mean, it is point. as old as, as the system itself. The political change that you'll see in America is when the white populace decides that they've been affected in other ways. And that's going to be the change. Mm -hmm. You're starting to see people in other countries who are saying, oh my God, or sorry, in other counties where they voted for Trump, they're starting to say, oh my gosh, my health care is going to be affected. Exactly. And now you're starting to see that tide turn. Very interesting. We'll see what happens. Thanks so much, guys. Thank Thanks you. again. No problem. We'll be right back with this story. Help. You know, watching pumps for nine days is long. She has young twins and a flooded home. We'll check in on an emotional Mother's Day in Quebec. Suicide is a huge problem here in this town. We lost so many friends. My best friend, Johnny, committed suicide. During his funeral at the church, I didn't cry. Not until he was getting put down six feet down for the last time I was going to see him. into million pieces. Before I 
was just a quiet guy, shy guy. But now I'm not shy anymore because I want people to be more happier. When calls the heart, new season this summer on CBC. I think once you're of the mindset that we're a country of alignment and a country of cooperation, then actually we're in a better position to do anything, is the truth of it. Our Canada is a land of many stories. The flag designed around the maple leaf. From the past. She was a tough girl. To the present. Success. From coast to coast to coast. This year. We must grasp it together. Share your experiences. That's what I love about the North. Your stories. Today I've become a Canadian citizen. Your Canada. It's everything that I think about. Join us. Oh, that is cold. CBC, home to 2017. CIBC, proudly celebrating 150 years together. A state of emergency was lifted this afternoon in parts of Montreal devastated by flooding. And some people have started to return home to assess the damage and clean up. But their frustrations don't end there. The CBC's Simon Nakaneshny explains. <laughs> For these women on Montreal's West Island, this Mother's Day brunch was a welcome break from a tough situation. Volunteers organized the event to honor moms affected by this year's flooding. But not far away, some mothers were just trying to hold it together. I have twins, so I have my basement upstairs and uh, there it's chaos. Help, you know, watching pumps for nine days is long. Hundreds of flood victims packed a local hockey rink in suburban Montreal. They came to find out what kind of financial help they can expect from the province, but also to deal with insurance claims and other challenges like turning the power back on and moldy basements. That's a big worry for Michael Lipkowitz, whose wife is pregnant. I don't care about basement, you know, I'll, I'll do that later on, but uh, I, can't, I can't take a chance having my wife uh, be in uh, the house and in the air not be safe. But some say what bothers them most is the thought their homes could have been spared had the city been more organized. And that's what did us in. I called them at 5.30 in the morning and they showed up at 5.30 at night. You know, but by then it was too late. We lost the house at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Officials say they did their best in the face of an historic crisis. The city did everything uh, humanly possible to try to provide the support that was necessary. Jim Bass is asking for patience as flood victims navigate the long road ahead. It was not an ideal Mother's Day for flood victims. Many will be pouring over government pamphlets instead of greeting cards. And while the floodwaters in their homes may be starting to go down, the pile of paperwork they'll need to go through to get their lives back on track is only going up. Simon Nakaneshny, CBC News, Dollar des Ormo. In B.C., parts of Kelowna remain under a flood watch. And emergency officials are urging residents to keep sandbags in place until the risk is over. The main concern is the swollen Okanagan Lake. Water levels have been rising steadily over the last few days. And a combination of rain and melting snow could pose a significant flood threat well into June. And a flooded stretch of highway in Labrador has now reopened. Two rural communities were cut off after the Northwest River Road was closed to traffic on Friday night. At the peak of the flood, water levels reached more than a metre and a half. The misery caused by flooding is always personal, but it's a story we've seen before. Hundreds of homes drowning in mud, hanging by a thread, or giving in to the relentless river. A record-breaking disaster from 1992. That's next on our Look Back. Another category of goods that has transformed our world, the gadgets or the tools of the electronic media. Here are some 
film projectors, the movies. I wonder what it really means, though, to be able to flick a switch and to bring in any part of the world to see the most personal relationships of mankind acted out before us. <laughs> it's so easy, isn't it? A handy, instantaneous gadget. The tape recorder. Small, portable, can go and the has gone everywhere. India, just a button's push away. Space means nothing. Uh, with a record collection, neither space nor time matter. We can, all of us, share in everything from anywhere and any time. Well, back to box day with the uh, flick of a wrist. Fabian, Frankie Avalon, uh, the voice of FDR, Petrushka, the music of Arabia, the sound of a sports car race in Florida. Even the most Puritan among us engages now each and every day in an absolute Roman carnival of the senses. There are new sights, new sounds, new fabrics, new textures. Well, we're all dedicated libertines. And radio. Well, we've heard the sound of symphonies, of riots, and of battles, and all without leaving the living room. And now, radio goes with us to beach parties. Stick. Or to the baseball game. And each of us with our own private slice of the modern age. We're never out of touch. And television? Well, I wonder who really knows what it means to have pouring into our homes day after day the cowboys, the rock and roll singers, the statesmen, the philosophers, the whole debate of our modern world. Well, surely, our sense of space, of time, cause and effect must be changing. And our attitudes to life and love, to religion, politics and leisure, what of them? Oh, I, I almost forgot the telephone. Uh, we can afford to take it for granted because it's been around so long. Surely, though, our, our sense of space, of distance, the uh, relationship of person from person no longer means what it did. And you'll notice that the image of the telephone goes with the teenager, because he's the only one completely at home using it. And he uses it all the time. That's annoying, isn't it, to be held up even five minutes? Must be a teenager on the other end. Well, there they are. Our new electronic media, or our new gadgets. You push a button, and the world's yours. You know how they talk about the world getting smaller? Well, it's thanks to these that it is. Everywhere is now our own neighborhood. We know what it's like to go on safari in Kenya or to have an audience with the Pope, to order a cognac in a Paris cafe. But not only is the world getting smaller, it's becoming more available and more familiar to our minds and to our emotions. The world is now a global village. When Calls the Heart, new season this summer on CBC. I'm Carolyn from Winnipeg, and this is my story. We were on a mission to make newcomers know that they are welcome in their communities. There we were, all of us eager young pioneers, just turned professional, performing on all media in both languages, and then off to Toronto, and then New York, London, and tomorrow's the world. As you heard earlier, floodwaters across Quebec are receding. A massive cleanup effort is about to begin, but Quebecers have done this before after far worse flooding. Before we go, let's take a look back on what happened in the Saguenay region back in July 1996. It has been a wet and deadly 36 hours in northeastern Quebec. All day, local radio has been warning people in dozens of specific areas to leave their homes. And if they can't drive out, signal helicopters flying overhead so they can be flown out. At least seven people are dead, several more are missing, and thousands more have been forced to flee. A minister in the Quebec government described the situation in this region as apocalyptic, catastrophic. For more than a day, torrents of water have crashed through villages, towns, and cities, taking houses, in some cases, entire buildings with it. 
like clockwork, every five minutes a helicopter lands, bringing refugees from the flood. These people are from Grand Bay. It was terrible, like a hell. This is what they are escaping, hundreds of homes drowning in mud, hanging by a thread, or giving in to the relentless river. No one knows how many bridges and roads have collapsed, and the landmarks wiped out. This old pulp mill reopened as a museum just two weeks ago. Now it's a $6 million write-off. This disaster is unprecedented in Canada, and so is the relief fund, the largest ever collected by the Red Cross. The money has come from people all over the country, and this region knows it. Same with the destruction. The cars buried under mud, the homes swept out into the river, whole neighborhoods gone. That one house with the now famous foundation that alone resisted. Things people here will never forget, their disaster and the charity of others. And that's The National for this Sunday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Mesley. Thanks for watching.